get started here. First, thank you for coming. Hope you're enjoying Montana. We do. So, uh, start off with the land acknowledgement, which is, to me, a very important part of this whole deal. We begin by acknowledging that we are gathered in the homelands, homeland of the Salis and Glipe people. We're committed to respectfully sharing the history and the contemporary culture of the indigenous people who lived and traveled through this land. We learn from many indigenous artists, elders, and organizations, and we invite you as well to learn and support from them. So enjoy your time here. We have been, well, we're quite pleased to have you all here, and I hope you will fill out the form at the end, so if there's anything we could make better, you will let us know. Now, to introduce our people, the presenters, we have Leslie, Josie, and Corey. Uh, Leslie, Josie Cliff, is an enrolled member of the Dakota Assiniboine tribe from the Fort Knapp Belknap Reservation in Montana. As a community leader, nonprofit executive, entrepreneur, business owner, very busy lady, Ms. Cliff has served her community creatively for decades, helping to develop resilience within the deeply impoverished Fort Belknap Indian community. Her passion for making the Fort Belknap community a better place to live for future generations inspires her in her role as the executive director of the Fort Belknap Community Economic Development Corporation. She has deep community knowledge and an exceptional history program. Josie currently serves as a board member, treasurer, for the Red Paint Creek Development Corporation and board member for the Island Mountain CDFI with an associate's degree in business administration from, now you're gonna have to help me, Aani, I would've gotten it right, Aani Nakota College and a bachelor's degree in healthcare administration, and I got this one, from Montana State University. Josie brings a deep understanding to her community and its needs, a keen understanding of the broader determinants of health, and a practical knowledge and successful experience of how to build and grow programs. Thank you. Corey Williamson is the senior outreach manager at American Prairie, a conservation nonprofit working to protect and restore 3.2 million acres of prairie and grassland ecosystems in central Montana. She works with communities and neighbors around the region and Montana more broadly to raise support and awareness of American Prairie's mission. Corey has lived in Montana for a decade, during which time she's worked in communications, outreach, and education as an adjunct producer, professor pardon me, at Carroll College and Helena College, a guide and educator in Yellowstone National Park, and the outreach director of Arrow. She is also a poet and a writer. <laughs> Okay, folks, you need to buy a book, all right? <laughs> She's a poet and a writer and the author of two books of poems, including The River Where You Forgot My Name. And if you just explain that title, it would be good. Uh, a 2019 Montana Book Award finalist with many poems focused on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now that we have done that, I'm going to pass this on to you ladies, and thank you. Thank you so much, Lee. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, again, I'm Corey, and I'm really thrilled to share the presentation time today with my friend Josie. Um, and I'm going to kick us off. And I wanted to start with this image, which I think will be very familiar to many of you. Uh, this is a Charles M. Russell piece. It hangs in the Historical Society in Helena, Montana. Um, and does anybody know the title? It's a beautiful title. When the land belonged to God. Um, and I invite you to come with me to this landscape today to visit the central Montana prairies and the Missouri River country that so amazed Lewis and Clark um, with its wildlife and its people. 
Um, and of course, this image is showing a vast herd of bison. We've got our wolves. Thanks, Dan Flores, by the way, for really teeing me up today. Um, and you can see that the bison stretch across the Missouri River and are coming down the banks here. Um, and this is Square Butte out in central Montana near where Josie and I live. I live in Lewistown, exact center of the state, and Josie lives um, on Fort Belknap. Uh, so this is the, the neck of the woods where Lewis and Clark talked about immense herds of buffalo, elk, deer, and antelope feeding in one common and boundless pasture. And one day Lewis said he thought he counted 3,000 bison. And another day he said he thought he counted 20,000 bison and that the ground was rumbling during the rut with their roaring and their stamping. Um, and in some ways, this is an area along that Lewis and Clark Trail that has changed very little. So in, Dundo in Undaunted Courage, Stephen Ambrose writes about canoeing the Missouri River breaks, and that's the neck of the woods that we're talking about and how if you really want to experience the country the way that Lewis and Clark saw it, that's a place where you can do that. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't quite look like this anymore. <laughs> uh, so what does it look like? that Missouri River country through Montana's prairie and plains. What's happening there for land, for flora and fauna, and for communities. And so our goal today is give you, to give you a little slice of that. And I'm gonna talk about wildlife and conservation through my work at American Prairie. Um, and then I'll pass it to Josie who will talk about a different kind of conservation um, and protecting language and restoring culture um, and empowering youth and gaining food sovereignty on Fort Belknap. So where exactly are we talking about? Uh, we're over here in lovely Missoula. So the neck of the woods that we're gonna focus on today is sort of this chunk in north, central, eastern Montana. Uh, I live here in Lewistown. Fort Belknap is kind of up here, um, a little bit more north of that. Uh, so again, I'm the senior outreach, for, senior outreach manager for American Prairie. Um, and American Prairie is a nonprofit conservation organization. It's funded by donations. It was founded in 2001, so we're 22 years old. We're based in the central Montana region, and we're working to protect and restore a vast grassland ecosystem. Our mission is to create one of the largest nature reserves in the United States, this will serve as a refuge for people and wildlife forever. And when we talk about this mission, we often say that it's, you can think about it as a three-legged stool, right? And the legs of the stool are land, wildlife, and people. And that our goal is to work together to create a place where all three of those are thriving. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of those legs. But I'm gonna start with land uh, and talk a little bit about why American Prairie exists and why it is urgent that it exists. But before I do that, just again, um, I'm Corey Williamson. Um, please, I forgot my cards at home, of course I did. Um, I'm easy to get a hold of if you have questions um, that we don't get to answer in this presentation today. If you wanna come out and visit the prairie, um, give me a shout. Uh, as Lee mentioned, I'm a writer, I've been a professor, an educator, um, and my book, The River Where You Forgot My Name, um, includes a lot of poems about Lewis and Clark and also sections which are written in a voice that I imagined for Julia Hancock, who is the young woman that married William Clark after he returned from the expedition and who grew up in the same little town in Virginia that I did. Um, and the river where you forgot my name is the Judith River in Montana, where I now work and live um, because Clark thought that 13-year-old Julia was pretty cute, but he wasn't quite sure what her name was, so. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to show this map to start. This is a map of our national parks, and I think it's really fun to sort of think about, well, what, what have we chosen to preserve? What have we chosen to set aside and protect, and what does that tell us about ourselves? And I think you see some neat ecological and, and cultural variety in this list, but one thing that you definitely don't see that we don't have um, is prairie at an ecosystem scale. And I want to define what that means. So when I talk about ecosystem scale, I mean a large, self-sustaining, resilient landscape. A place that has the vast majority of its flora and fauna intact, and because of that biodiversity, is resilient in the face of things like wildfire, drought, hard winters, all of which we have in spades in central Montana. 
Um, and in the late 90s, a group with scientists from the Nature Conservancy and World Wildlife Fund and others got together and said, okay, if we want to preserve grasslands and prairies, if we want to set aside a fully functioning prairie ecosystem, we need 3.2 to 3.5 million acres. And there are only four places left on the planet that you can do that. The Kazakh steppe, the Mongolian steppe, the Patagonian steppe, and the Northern Great Plains. Uh, and if we want to do this, we need to do it soon because prairies are the least protected and the most endangered fastest disappearing ecosystem on Earth. So why Montana? Why American Prairie? Uh, there's two reasons for this. Uh, so in that same study that came out in the 90s, this part of Montana was identified as of high priority for grasslands conservation because we still have so much of our grass left. Right? So prairies historically have been um, tilled, turned up for crop agriculture, but in this part of Montana, they've mostly been grazed. Right? So they haven't been plowed, they've had cattle on them for the last 100 or 150 years, but they've been stewarded by those ranching communities um, and they still have their grasses, they still have their intact native topsoils um, and quite a bit of their historical flora and fauna that Lewis and Clark would have seen. And then the other reason that this makes this project makes so much sense in this part of Montana is that so much of the land out there is already public. You and me, it's already ours. And I'm gonna talk more about that and kind of invite you on a little visual land ownership journey of this part of the world. So this is just a satellite map. Um, this is the Missouri River. This is the Fort Peck Reservoir, right? So coming off of the Fort Peck Dam, uh, Lewistown is kind of down here in the Judith Mountains. Uh, here's the Judith River coming into the Missouri. And let's overlay it with some of our human stuff. So Highway 191, um, cutting through up to the High Line. Um, again, Lewistown where I live, the Fort Belknapinian community where Josie lives, um, and then the Rocky Boy Reservation over here and the Missouri River cutting through it all. Let's keep building this out. So what I've put in green here now, this is the Charles M. Russell Wildlife Refuge. So this is an area that's already protected for habitat, for wildlife. It's already accessible for recreation. It's managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's 1.1 million acres. This refuge serves as the anchor of the American Prairie Project. Now I've added the Upper Missouri River Breaks National Monument. If you've never canoed it, put it on your bucket list. Um, this is managed by the Bureau of Land Management. It's 377,000 acres. So suddenly between those two protected areas, we're already looking at almost a million and a half acres. So suddenly 3.2 or 3.5 doesn't seem quite so unachievable. Now, this is where it gets really fun. All of this green, all this kind of pale green, this is public land already. Most of it is BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and most of it is leased to ranchers. Most of it is grazed, so it is managed um, for production agriculture, but it's public. Um, all of these public chunks are tied to private. So if you're a rancher out there and you purchase a 3,000 3, acre private piece of property, it might come with another 5,000 acres of public land that you can then graze. So American Prairie's method, our approach, is to buy private pieces on the market. So this is kind of free market conservation. Um, when ranchers or other property owners decide that they want to put a piece up for sale, um, whether they're downsizing, whether somebody didn't come home to inherit the ranch for whatever reason, um, American Prairie will buy those private chunks, and with them come those public allotments. So the idea is to buy private land around these already big protected chunks and sort of glue together more and more public land so that ultimately um, we open up that private section to the public, we do um, wildlife and grasslands restoration, and we end up with three and a half million acres of contiguous prairie habitat over time. So this is the map we typically use to talk about sort of what American Prairie is owning and managing now. Uh, it's a jigsaw puzzle, right? 
So we've been around for 20 years. Um, we're currently sitting at a little over 460,000 acres that we own or manage. Um, and we're very much a work in progress. Um, we expect to be around for many hundred more years and to over time continue to connect and build out these different protected areas of the prairie. Uh, but what I think this map shows most clearly is how necessary collaboration is for this kind of work, right? So working with government agencies, with the BLM, with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in Montana, with our neighbors, with ranchers, with the tribes, right? For this kind of thing to work, we have to figure out what this is gonna look like together. Um, which leads me to my next pillar. So I've talked a little bit about land and I wanna transition into talking about people um, and the folks that we collaborate with as neighbors. But first I'll show one more map. This is a map from Montana's Office of Public Instruction uh, and it shows the historic homelands of different Montana tribes and then in the red, the reservations where they live now. So I think no conservation story today uh, is complete without acknowledgement and representation of indigenous communities and recognizing that all our public lands are carved from those historic homelands. Uh, and so we've talked a lot about the tribes that were present here um, in the western part of the state and where American Prairie operates. Um, we know that that landscape was used and called home by generations of Aani, Nakoda, Blackfeet, Sioux, Crow, Chippewa Cree, and Métis. And one of our goals is to honor that cultural connection, that history, and to work with and learn from our neighbors. So I'll talk a little bit about how we do that with indigenous communities. Um, Fort Belknap, Fort Peck, and Rocky Boy are all fairly close neighbors to American Prairie. And so what we've really tried to do is be a good neighbor, right? And figure out ways that we can find mutually beneficial collaborations. We can honor one another's priorities. So for us, that work looks like cultural interpretation and educational programming. Um, so one of the programs under Josie is Ani Nakota Tours. And we hire guides from Fort Belknap to come out and take visitors on the prairie to do educational programming, to offer that indigenous lens on the landscape where we work. This also looks like bison exchange and wildlife restoration. So American Prairie has sent more than 500 buffalo to tribes across the country including helping to start the new herd at Rocky Boy. Uh, it includes agricultural collaborations. So folks from Fort Belknap participate in our Wild Sky program, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. And it means stewarding the cultural resources on the landscape. So in 3.2 million acres, you can imagine there are many stone circles, there are buffalo jumps, there are medicine rocks. And so finding ways to ensure that indigenous people have access to those sites and kind of meaningful cultural ways to engage with them. Uh, so this is from an event that happened this past April. I'm not sure if I'm, I don't know if my computer is connected to sound. I don't hear it. Um, this, is, this is actually a video, but why I love it is because there's a little meadowlark on this teepee pole and you can hear him singing in the video. Um, and a, a veteran of um, the war in Afghanistan from Fort Belknap came to us and said, I want to invite my platoon to experience the prairie. And I want to take them on a traditional buffalo hunt at Fort Belknap. And I want to do horse painting. And I want to share my culture with them for healing. And I need a place to do it. Um, and so we offered our Antelope Creek campground. Um, and they put up three teepees. And they spent a couple days out there on the prairie. Um, and it was really really cool and moving to see those teepees on the landscape and to think about ceremony and cultural practices happening in a place that has been historic homelands of those communities for a long time. Uh, this got mentioned last night really briefly, but I wanted to just sort of give another shout out for Ken Burns' uh, upcoming film, The American Buffalo. Um, so Ken was just here in Missoula a couple weeks ago and he was in Lewistown, um, where I live, presenting on this film and showing some sneak peeks. And this is really a film about the ways that the buffalo and indigenous communities are intricately tied together. Um, some of it was filmed at American Prairie, some of it was filmed on Fort Belknap, some of it was filmed at the Bison Range. Um, and my good friend and Josie's colleague Junior was interviewed throughout this film. Um, and it's just a, it's a great one to see and, and keep on your radar. 
Uh, back to people. So agriculture is the dominant industry in central Montana and probably always will be. Um, and our idea is that American Prairie can coexist and collaborate with the agricultural community and that a lot of the work we do today is possible because of the stewardship um, of our ranching neighbors. So we lease quite a bit of our land back to neighboring cattle ranchers um, to run cattle. We want to see large grazing herbivores on the landscape managed responsibly. We want to support agriculture in the region and we want to work with our neighbors to create trust and collaboration. And I think ideally our neighbors out there will always be conservation-minded ranchers. Uh, one of the neat ways we do that is our Wild Sky program. So healthy wildlife moves, right? It migrates, it travels. It doesn't really care about our fences and our arbitrary property lines. Um, so how do we grow wildlife populations? How do we protect biodiversity and key migration corridors? and also be good neighbors to the guy across the fence who is worried that the elk are gonna eat all of his grass or that the black bears are gonna go after his lambs. And our answer is the Wild Sky program. So this is a, um, a really neat program that incentivizes neighbors, typically ranchers, to tolerate wildlife and offset the cost of doing so because we know that having large herds, having lots of wildlife on your land has an economic impact. Um, and so we want to see those populations go up. We want to see our neighbors be happy about that and increase that social caring capacity. So folks who participate in this program sign a contract um, for wildlife friendly ranching. And so that might be putting in wildlife friendly fencing where the bottom fence line or the bottom wire is higher off the ground so that pronghorn can go under because they will not go over. It might be agreeing not to shoot your prairie dogs it might be agreeing to fence out cattle from riparian areas. Um, or it might be signing a Cameras for Conservation contract. An American Prairie will pay participants in this program simply for pictures of wildlife, because they're already tolerating those animals. And so we're saying, thanks for doing that. Here's a way we can support you doing that. Um, this is a black bear. I know it really, it looks very color wise like a grizzly, but it is a black bear. Um, not a lot of grizzlies yet out there um, in central Montana, but um, ranchers and landowners can get paid 25 bucks for a picture of a coyote, 500 bucks for a picture of a grizzly bear or wolf, which hasn't happened yet. Um, 250 bucks for a mountain lion. So my friend and colleague Katie Beatty, who runs this program, has a great slide where she shows a photo of a mother mountain lion and three cubs. And that was a thousand dollar check to that landowner just for that picture. I want to acknowledge that not everybody is supportive of this model. Um, it may seem like an obvious cool idea to you and to me um, to have bison on the prairie, to have more wildlife on the prairie, but that's not what everyone believes. Um, land ownership is changing in Montana. Um, we have many, many generations of indigenous history in the state, and then about 150 years of agriculture and ranching. And there are a lot of different feelings about the highest and the best use of the land. Um, and it's very tied to our personal values. It's very tied to legacy and to history. Um, and my job is to create more transparent conversation. Um, it's to facilitate community involvement. It's to keep our neighbors aware. It's to hear concerns um, and to see more collaboration happening in the region. Um, and so one of my kind of questions for you to think about um, is about that idea of land and legacy. Lewis and Clark are our legacy. Our lands and how we use them are our legacy and who we share them with wildlife or people. Um, I got to go deep into the Bob Marshall Wilderness last summer and took this picture at the um, Big Prairie Ranger Station there. And it's the Forest Service, but wood, water, forage, wildlife, recreation, right? What are our lands for? So I want to talk a little bit more about what American Prairie is using lands for, what we're doing out there. Uh, wildlife restoration is a big one. Um, and seeing lines of hundreds of pronghorn on their winter migrations is one of the most incredible spectacles I've ever seen. And so our work involves restoring riparian habitat for beavers, maybe putting in beaver analog dams, replanting native grasses in disturbed areas. 
managing hunting responsibly so that we can continue to grow wildlife numbers and laying the groundwork so that when grizzly bears and wolves return to this region, which they will, which they are beginning to do, there will be habitat that can receive and welcome them. It's also working with our partners. Um, this is a camera trap photo of swift fox pups. Swift fox were extirpated from the region years ago, and the Fort Belknap Reservation, as a sovereign nation, can make totally independent decisions about wildlife reintroduction that private property owners cannot. So Fort Belknap reintroduced swift fox in 2020. Um, and interns at Ani Nakota College and our partners at the Smithsonian have been tracking those foxes. They're spreading out, they're dispersing. We've now seen them at American Prairie as well. Bison. In 2005, um, American Prairie reintroduced 16 animals to the landscape for the first time in 120 years. Um, our bison herds now number around 800 animals between two herds. And the goal is to continue to grow those numbers, but we are really committed to big herds on big properties. Because we don't want a couple of bison over here and a couple of bison over here. We want bison doing their thing. <laughs> we want them having an ecologically significant impact on the landscape. So now our two herds are on a, a 30,000 acre parcel and about a 25,000 acre parcel. So they can really move, they can really be bison. Um, we manage their populations by distributing them. Um, again, bison have calves every year. Those calves are really resilient. Their populations grow fast. So we distribute bison to other conservation herds and to tribes, and we do manage a bison harvest. We do have a public bison hunt where people can come out and experience the animals that way on the landscape, which is part of um, how they've always been managed. In Montana, Bison are livestock, with a couple of exceptions. So Yellowstone has a wild herd, and now the Blackfeet have a wild herd. I don't know if you saw this, in the last couple of days, the Blackfeet released wild bison um, on the edge of Glacier National Park, which is pretty cool. Um, but the rest of us have to manage bison as livestock. Um, so we do so in keeping with state uh, livestock laws. Um, we do a bison roundup every year, and we test representative samples of the herd for disease because we want to be a good neighbor. Um, and I'll show you, get it to play. We do this in total silence. We do it in the cold because it's less stressful for the animals. They go through this squeeze shoot. Um, we take blood and fecal samples. We work with our science partners to sometimes um, collar and tag oops, the animals for research purposes. So here's that bison. She's been fitted with a GPS collar. And she is out of there. Yeah, bison don't like this. Bison are wild. There she goes. Um, it's really, really cool to go to a bison handling and be that close to these animals. Um, one year I was in charge of putting halters on their nose and kind of pulling that aside while the vet looked for that neck vein and I was just like covered in bison snot and blood and it was like zero degrees and I was like, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, American Prairie is um, a place where you can hunt. So we think that hunting is part of conservation and that we could build conservationists this way. We can increase access in a time when public access is becoming more and more limited. Um, we collaborate with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to do this. We have about 80,000 acres in block management. And then, of course, so much of this landscape is already public. Um, and again, we offer that kind of limited bison harvest every year to continue to manage populations responsibly, be sustainable on the landscape, and grow advocates um, for prairie wildlife. We also think that American Prairie can be an unparalleled place for science and research. Right? What a field for a botanist and a naturalist, William Clark said about the prairies. Um, so we, we have all kinds of graduate students and researchers out there. There's a group from University of Montana out there right now, and they are capturing beavers and collaring beavers to study their movements. And you don't collar a beaver around its neck, because beavers don't really have necks. I don't know if you've noticed that. You collar them around the base of their tail. Um, our official science partners are the, I'm not stuck here. There we go. Um, the Smithsonian National, excuse me, National Zoological Park and Conservation Biology Institute. 
Uh, this is Dr. Hila Shimon and Dr. Dr. Andy Boyce. They're out there for their summer field seasons right now. They are doing all kinds of studies from grassland bird diversity to bison movement to the swift fox reintroduction program in partnership with Fort Belknap. Um, I love these. They set up a lot of recorders and they measure bird diversity by recording bird sounds, all kinds of neat stuff. And they're producing really valuable research. So this is a paper that Andy and Gila published a couple years ago showing that bison reintroduction is associated with more birds um, and more deer occupying rivers and riparian areas. This was a piece that came out in collaboration with different tribal buffalo programs um, about the restoration of bison for tribal food sovereignty. This was Kansas, which is a, a different kind of prairie, um, the tall grass prairie, but still really relevant, right? Again, that bison co-evolved with that landscape, that they are prairie architects, and that having them on it again in ecologically significant vast landscapes is good for the land, is good for diversity. Uh, we wanna see the scientific and educational opportunities of the prairie extended to young people. Um, so we run a, a prairie field school, which you can spend two nights and three days out on the prairie um, if you are a fifth through eighth grade Montana student. Um, this year, three quarters of the schools visiting were from indigenous communities. Uh, this is a partnership that we do with the Montana Outdoor Science School. Um, we also do teacher education um, and have worked to develop curriculum so that even if you can't come to the prairie, you can bring it to you in your classroom. And I invite you to visit. Um, we really see the American Prairie Project as additive to the central Montana community. Thousands of visitors are coming every year and we think that agriculture and wildlife and tourism and conservation can all exist together and be supportive of the region's culture and economy. And we know from natural systems that a more diverse system is a more resilient one. And I think that's true too in communities. Um, access is, to, is essential to us. It's a core part of our mission. Everything we've bought is open to the public. Um, it's a place to play, to recreate, to explore, to learn. There is no entrance fee no park gate anywhere. This little hut is perched at Judith Landing on the Missouri. It's one of a little, one of three in a hut system that we have and we plan to build some more. Here's a quote from a visitor um, a couple of years ago. We were lucky enough to be the first into the cabin this year. About 55 degrees yesterday, snowing hard tonight. To be expected in April, surely. And wildlife to be expected to some degree, of course, as well but we have simply been overwhelmed. Here's a sampling. Geese, pelicans, ducks, beavers, bald eagles, deer, coyote, turkey, black bear, bighorn sheep, red-tailed hawk, golden eye in the Judith River, kestrel, almost all of the sightings just right from the deck or out the window. Truly stunning, gorgeous, humbling. Um, these are part of that hut system that you can visit. Um, I've left a bunch of maps and some information about American Prairie on the table outside and invite you to take any of it and to come see us. Um, this is our Antelope Creek campground right off of Highway uh, 191. It has a two-mile interpretive loop with lots of great signage. It has cabins, RV hookups, tent sites, and the nicest bathrooms in a 50-mile radius. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> um, and this is our, our buffalo camp. Um, this is a really neat place to stay. This is on our Sun Prairie property, which is a 30,000 acre um, restored prairie property with about 400 buffalo on it. And so you might set up your tent, ideally on one of these platforms so they don't walk on top of you in the middle of the night and wake up and see bison right outside your tent. Uh, you can float the Judith River, you can float the Missouri River, you can hike, you can bike, you can horseback ride. You can come for wildflowers in the spring, bison calves in May and the rut in the fall, the dance of the sage grouse in the spring, which again, if you have never seen it, get out there and see it. Um, and again, this is that kind of overview American Prairie map. This is the PN unit at Judith Landing. This is the Sun Prairie unit. There's bison here and there's bison here on White Rock. You can also visit us in Lewistown at our National Discovery Center, which is our gateway to the prairie. Um, this is an absolutely beautiful world-class exhibit space in a historic building on Main Street in Lewistown. Um, we have 
great exhibits. We have educational programming. If you're sticking around through this weekend, we have Barry Friedman coming on Saturday to talk about um, the history of Indian trade camp blankets. Um, and before I turn it over to Josie, I wanted to show this video because I did show that when the land belonged to God at the beginning, and I said that it doesn't look like that anymore. But sometimes it does. And it might look more and more like that. These are bison on American Prairie. Um, this was filmed in September last year by one of our board members. The prairie does turn brown in September. <laughs> um, and we have been in drought um, for the last three years in central Montana, though we have had a beautiful wet spring out there this year. And the grass is high and green and filled with mosquitoes. Um, but I just, I just love this. Um, and just as in that Charlie Russell painting, look at them. They're out here. They're just stretching across the landscape. They're kind of headed to this little wet spot here. Um, and just to kind of see how they move and how they go and how the young ones are kind of playing, um, I just think it's very cool to see them out there doing their thing. They look like they're having fun to me. <laughs> and I will um, end with a quote before I hand it to Josie from Wallace Steigner. A prairie big enough to carry the eye clear to the sinking, rounding horizon can be as lonely and grand and sublime in its forms as the sea. It is as good a place as any for the wilderness experience to happen. The vanishing prairie is as worth preserving for the wilderness idea as the alpine forest. Thank you. And we will do questions together at the end, but I want to make sure Josie has plenty of time to talk about her important work. Thank you. Amboashte Dayawa Chimnaga Yuhana Machbia Mahajuya Imajia Wasewakba Gichi Dayaha. Good day, everyone. It's good to see you all. My Nakota name is Raining Cloud Woman, and I am from Red Paint Creek, also known as Lodgepole, Montana, on the Fort Belknap Binden Reservation. Um, thank you, Corey. That was a really awesome um, PowerPoint. I always learn a lot, um, so I'm learning all with you too. So I don't know every everything. Um, so about um, all the good work that we, I mean, the continued good work, um, and it's just I just really enjoy that learning new things and the work that we do together and the collaboration. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Nakota Ani Economic Development Corporation. Um, I'm the executive director. I've been in that role since 2018. Um, and before that, I was the store manager for Red Paint Creek Trading Post. Um, like Corey said, we do a lot of collaboration work um, with American Prairie. Um, very fortunate um, to have them right in our backyard. Um, it's really cool. And just all the work that um, looking forward to new projects and whatnot. Um, so we're a native nonprofit uh, located in, uh, on Fort Belknap Reservation. Um, I have a staff of um, about I think 12. We're looking at getting another um, a staff member joined. Um, our mission as a native nonprofit is to promote a thriving cultural sustainable economy on the No? Oh, it's still on. Okay. Um, and how we do that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, the programs that are under our nonprofit. We have four programs that we use um, to accomplish that mission. Um, we started in 2014, so we're a fairly new nonprofit. But we uh, really, we've really grown. <laughs> Okay. I'm wondering if it might be. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, 
So we use four programs, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through that, how we accomplish that mission. Um, and I'll just, the next slide is, or these are some of the pictures of some of the work that we do. I couldn't fit, like, because we have a lot of pictures of the work we do. So we work uh, with food sovereignty, Corey mentioned, um, and youth leadership. And there's Ju George Horse Capture Jr. He's on the film she talked about. Um, he's our tourism director. Oh, I'll just speak louder. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi, there. And here's, I'm just sharing with you our board members and our nonprofit board. And then some of our previous board members. Uh, and then our staff here, so myself. Kaya Grant, she's, uh, she's learning everything that I do, so kind of job shadowing. She's really awesome in leading our youth leadership program. Uh, George Horse Capture, uh, a lot of us call him Junior, um, and he's very instrumental um, in growing our tourism program, and he works alongside with his younger brother, Pete Horse Capture. We're very fortunate for him to join us, join our team this year. Uh, Randy Fetter is our food sovereignty coordinator. She's been very instrumental in growing our food sovereignty program on Fort Hilton. And then our youth leadership coordinator, um, that position is vacant and we will be hiring that position next week. So really excited. Um, we started that program last year. Really want to invest in our youth, our local youth, and just to show them the many opportunities that there is on Fort Belknap and then also off by collaborating with APR, a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities. So just trying to get, get them um, to see that you know, in a different mindset. So a lot of the work that I do, I also have to do that too with my community because it's like change that doesn't happen overnight. And then we also have uh, language revitalization under our nonprofit. Oh, thank you. And we have uh, Mariah Horseman, very uh, fortunate to have her. She has her um, linguistic degree from Dartmouth, and she's a, a, a member of the Aani tribe. So very, very fortunate to have her. I'm a, I'm a big supporter of growing our own people and um, supporting them and in, in the, the skills that they're gifted with. So the, these people are very gifted in the, the language um, in growing that and and, and doing that and teaching our own people to do that with, you know, creating curriculum in both languages. So it, it, it's really, really awesome to see and really awesome to work with uh, young staff and, and to grow them and, and just help keep our languages alive. Um, she also works with uh, Gabriel Work. Um, he's the Nakota Language Resource Specialist. And these two individuals, they, um, the work that they do is they take the, um, the language, uh, there's, so Indiana University has a lot of Nakota language stories, um, written, written Nakota um, documents, um, songs, and so what they do, what Gabriel does is he, he, we have like over a thousand stories that Indiana has, and what his job is, he has to go in there and listen to those stories like really, really closely with a certain type of software because it, when they recorded it back in the 70s and the 80s, they um, recorded it as a Lakota orthography. So it's mixed with Lakota and Nakota, but we're, we have separate languages like how we write it and the sounds. So he has a tedious job of going back and listening to all those stories because there's new words within those stories and it takes like an hour. So one minute of translation, he has to listen to an hour of it to get it translated for one minute. <laughs> so he, he has a lot of tedious work to do, but he, he loves his job. And, and he's very skilled at it, and it's very a, very, uh, a necessity, I guess, to bring our language back and preserve it. We also have two individuals um, that are uh, language apprentices, so they're learning to become fluent speakers. 
and so they're they're also under our language revitalization. So one of one of our um, long term goals is to um, open an immersion school for both lang both languages. But part of that is we have to grow our speakers and our curriculum before we can do that. So. And then I'm just gonna I have a slide for each one of our programs, and this is just touching on some of the stuff. There's like a whole bunch of stuff that we've done, and I just couldn't fit it on all these slides. It would have been crazy. So our tourism program is um, led by uh, Junior Horse Capture and Pete, Pete Horse Capture. Um, we have we have increased our tourism lodging accommodations because we're such in an isolated area. We don't have a lot of hotels and like well, American Prairie added Antelope Creek Creek Campground. Uh, we started a mobile RV rental program um, under our tourism, and then we also uh, purchased a new um, house in Harlem, and we're turning that into an Airbnb rental property. So that, that's in, in the making right now. So Pete's, Pete and Junior are heading that up. Um, we also have a uh, gift shop that's located in Hayes, Montana at the Kills at Night Center. And part of that gift shop is um, to generate revenue that goes back into the tourism program. Uh, we also have, um, we offer local artists free consignment because we're supportive of entrepreneurship and helping them grow their business. Uh, we also offer arts and crafts supplies because a lot of the people can't, you know, they have a hard time finding materials and whatnot to do their crafts. Uh, we also have completed 17 miles of hiking trails in the Little Rockies, and I apologize I didn't get a map up there because we're still in the process of updating our website um, with explaining all the work we do. Um, we also collab with American Prairie and get in cultural interpretive guide guides um, certified so they're marketable not on Fort Belknap but also in, like in national parks and, and American Prairie too. Uh, we, and then Pete started our drone virtual tourism program so he's gonna get like a lot of aerial footage like even uh, even for myself that have not seen a Fort Belknap I mean just it we've seen some footage it, I think a clip Rod Benson, a uh, community, or he lives outside of Fort Belknap. He took some uh, drone footage and it was just like, wow, that, that's where we live? <laughs> so, so that's really exciting. Um, and then cultural art, arts and crafts workshops. So like teaching people how to make ribbon skirts. Whoa, ribbon skirts, like the one I have on. Um, ribbon shirts, belt, belt making, different types of arts and crafts. So people have been really um, excited about attending those. Um, and then we also offer agricultural, cultural, educational, wildlife, hiking, sightseeing tours on and off Fort Belknap. So like Corey said, we, we do get a lot of um, people that are interested in uh, visiting the reservation and just getting exposed to like indigenous um, culture and stories. And Junior's an awesome storyteller, so by the way. <laughs> uh, and so that's just a little bit of uh, our tourism program. Um, I'm gonna go into our language revitalization. Uh, I talked a little bit about the um, dictionaries like Gibby and Mariah are working on. Um, we created the first ever language immersion nest on Fort Belknap. So that's open to um, children zero to five. And so we're trying to reach where it's total immersion. Um, and, and we work, our nonprofit um, that was kind of like a pilot project, and so it, it turned over to a new nonprofit, um, Life's Language Lodge, but we were just kind of like the, the starter of that project. <laughs> um, very, very exciting to see um, those small children talking in their native language. I like, every time I see clips and I go to work and I about cry because it's so awesome to see. And those little moments is those are worth all the work that we do, and sometimes the challenging stuff too. Uh, and then I'll move into our food sovereignty program. Uh, Randy Fetters, our food sovereignty coordinator. Um, people ask how we do it on Fort Belknap, and I think it's just we do a lot of trial and error. We do a lot of. Um, Randy does a lot of education and outreach to people that are interested in home gardening. 
Um, and this is just some of the stuff that we've grown. Um, we put in 50 fruit forests last, or in 2022. Um, we have five high tunnels on Fort Belknap, but they're in different community gardens. We, uh, the, some community members uh, constructed a wall of peony. It's an earth sheltered greenhouse in Lodgepole. Um, what else? Just kind of. These are. It's it's a lot of work. So you can see all the wheels that spin within our nonprofit. This year we uh, got awarded a grant through the U.S. our Montana Department of Ag. Ag. It was the GTA. So we're going to be constructing a geothermal greenhouse in Lodgepole. So we've been collaborating with Bob Quinn in Big Sandy. I don't know if you guys heard about him. It's a, it's a greenhouse in the snow model from Nebraska. So. We're gonna, we hope to have some citrus oranges and lemons and stuff too. <clears throat> we also have a solar water well. So these are all like little mini projects and this, the, the Lodgepole Garden is, we always call like a little research site. So we have fruit tree orchard, which is one of 20 MSU research site in Montana. I apologize. Um, so just, seeing what types of apple trees, pears, different types of fruit trees that grow good in the area. And if people want to start an orchard, then, then they can. They can actually come to that orchard and get, you know, graft trees and start their own and do that on their, you know, if they choose to start an orchard. Um, we've seen a, a huge increase in home gardens, and I think that was um, due to COVID, <laughs> unfortunately, but it was really exciting it re to see them push to grow their own food and the excitement when they do grow their own food and it's like, I can do this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really cool to be a part of. Um, last year we started a youth leadership program because I'm a big supporter of investing in our youth and, you know, because they're going to be our next generation that grow everything on Fort Belknap all the cool stuff. Um, we started a IYE committee. Um, I'm on that volunteer committee too. Um, teaching youth the protocol, planning, fundraising for youth powwow. So we have like seven powwows on Fort Belknap throughout the year. And one of the things um, this committee does is we mentor youth and teach them how to organize and fundraise for youth powwow, and they actually run it that the day before all our regular powwows. So we set aside one day for them, but we also teach them. We're there, you know, helping them, because that's really part, important part of our our culture is um, sharing that knowledge. Last year we co-hosted a um, summer culture camp, which was really uh, well received by the community and families. So this year we're putting on three. And the, those are going to be held at, during the weeks of our summer powwows. So one will be coming up in July, and then at Milk River, and then the Hayes powwow. And that's just, the, just to, it, that sort of came from a, a survey we did last year with our Native youth. Um, they were really interested in learning more about their culture and language. And so that's how those came about. And so we're just trying to, um, um, help them learn what what they're you know through that survey what they we we asked and whatnot surveyed them for um let's see if i miss oh we have nine summer interns this year um this summer and they're going to be working on their native games training certification um we've st oh we have those tour as our tours too and at apr we do um, native game demonstrations and uh, people are able to participate and play the games and it's it just so awesome to see the, the everyone just like laugh and enjoy enjoying themselves and so that that's one of the things we're also going to use for um, fundraising for our nonprofit is where we go put on native games training clinics at you know when people request it. We're going, actually going to Canada um, in August to put on a big Native Games training clinic. So that'll be our first fundraiser and, it, and it's an international fundraiser. <laughs> so, and I'm a big supporter of growing our staff so they're all getting certified in Native Games too. So. And I know I was really short, I apologize. We do a lot of work in our nonprofit and 
if you have any questions, like Corey said, if like if you want to visit American Prairie, if you guys want to visit us, it, it's in person. It's a lot more cooler to see everything than seeing it on a screen. So like our gardens, we have two bison herd on Fort Belknap too. Um, a lot of cultural scenic sites too. Um, just it's too much to put on these slides. So thank you. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out. Yes, um, I saw this hand first, and then we'll go to Lee. Yeah. Thank you for a fabulous presentation. I want to thank you both for a fabulous presentation. We can publicize your work in the newsletter of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. Four times a year, we come out electronically. 300 words in a picture, and we'll run it. <laughs> just, just send it to us. But what we hear, or I hear in the rest of the country, is not this, but rather the ranchers are concerned because of the alleged brucellosis in the bison. How realistic is their fear, given what you've told us about looking for illness and testing regularly? Thank you. Thank you, yeah, and thank you for the offer to, to share the work that, that we do and that, that Josie does. Um, yeah, so brucellosis is a, a disease that is not native to bison. It's a cattle disease um, that bison um, contracted from cattle historically, and now it exists in the bison population in Yellowstone. Um, brucellosis is a, it is a dangerous disease, and it's something that ranchers, you know, very wisely are concerned about. Um, it causes, it, it lives in the reproductive tissue of an animal and it would cause a female cow um, or bison to abort a pregnancy. Um, and if you are a rancher and it is found in your herd, you basically, you, you lose your whole herd. So it, it is, can have a huge impact. Um, brucellosis is present in Yellowstone because of the park's policies about how they handle those animals um, and what the national park system can do to treat and deal with disease in wild life, which is basically nothing. Um, American Prairie sources our buffalo from herds that have been brucellosis free for decades. So our animals initially came from Elk Island in Canada and from Wind Cave, and those animals do not have brucellosis, and we continue to test, right, because it is, it is a concern, it is a fear, um, but our animals have never had it. I anticipate they will never have it. Um, and again, it's a, it's a funny situation in Montana, right, because brucellosis is in elk, um, and the only documented case of brucellosis moving from wildlife to cattle is from elk and not from bison. Um, and so there's a, a little bit of a tension and a contradiction, I think, there. Um, but so I think I do, I always want to be sensitive to the concerns of my neighbors. Um, I know that it's tough out there for ranchers right now, and those bottom lines are really important, but American Prairie Bison are not going to give anybody brucellosis. Um, our bison are behind fences, too. Um, so again, because we have to manage them as livestock, they roam widely, but they do not free roam. Um, and they are behind wildlife-friendly fencing, and, you know, Sometimes they do get out, uh, like any like cows get out, and we go get them. And I had one neighbor who told me, well, you're faster than the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> Which means something in South Phillips County. <laughs> um, yeah, what else? Oh, oh, I promised you, Lee, sorry. That's okay. No, I, I was just curious about the, uh, the antelope and their migration and how you're managing the, uh, the basically the barbed wire fences. Yeah, so a huge issue for pronghorn all over the West is that, and maybe some of you have seen this, but our traditional fencing is like, you know, four strand barbed wire fences with a low bottom strand. And elk and deer, like they'll just pop over, right? No big deal. Pronghorn will not do that. They only want to go under. Um, and I've seen some really sad maps where folks have tracked pronghorn with GPS and you'll see, if it's working, right, you'll see these huge migrations. Pronghorn make one of the longest land migrations of any um, animal in the Western Hemisphere. And then I saw this map where there's a little square, 
and it was just fully colored in because somehow a pronghorn had gotten in this little tiny fenced in square pasture and it never got out. And so its little collar just tracked it round and around and around in that pasture. So all of our fencing that contain bison is wildlife friendly. And so that means that the bottom wire is 16 or 18, I forget, inches off the ground. So the pronghorn will go under it and it's smooth strand. Um, we also hang grouse flags on the top of the fence because um, sage grouse and other birds, as they come in and land, they sometimes get tangled in barbed wire. So if you put this flagging, it'll deter them from running into the fence. Um, if we have bison in a field, the second wire is electrified. So it's, sometimes you've probably seen bison fencing and it's like 10 feet high and like really intense wire. And we do have some people who come out and look at our bison fencing and say, whoa, really? <laughs> because it's just four strands. Um, but our method is to keep our stocking rate really low. So again, we run bison on these really big sections. We want them happy, we want them home, we want the grass to be really gorgeous and healthy. And so we keep that rate a lot lower than you know, laws require, than grazing allotments require. Um, and we just have a whole staff that lives out there and that's their job is to check fences and be on call if an animal gets out. Um, but that's one of the things we work with locals on our Wild Sky program too, is we'll help them replace old fencing with wildlife friendly fencing. And the state has some incentives to do that as well. So hopefully we'll see more and more and more of this wildlife friendly fencing that lets animals move and migrate. But that's a great question. I'm gonna go to the back. People in the back always get neglected. Did you have a question? Do you get any help from the Nature Conservancy? Because they're kind of the same philosophy of buying land and doing that. Yeah, if you didn't hear, the, the question was, do we get any help from the Nature Conservancy? Um, they were involved in some of those original studies around grassland restoration. And they actually have a property kind of near where we work called the Matador. And they run that as a grass bank. So they actually, they'll work with ranchers to come in. The ranchers will graze the grass on that property in exchange for implementing conservation practices back on their home ranch. So we work kind of in parallel out there. Um, we don't have any projects together. We don't exchange funds now. But yeah, that's a, another great grasslands program um, in the West. Somebody have a question for Josie? Yes. I'm very curious about the two languages. Is it two separate groups? Or could you explain a little about that a little bit? So I, I'm Nakoda. So Nakoda language is, um, it's, how is the easiest way to explain it? So there's Lakota, Dakota, and Nakoda. And so Lakotas have Al in their language. We don't have the Al in Nakoda. So ours is, in where they have Al's, we have the N. The same thing with Dakota. Um, so they're just, and they have their own dialect. So there's like Eastern dialect Nakoda and Western dialect Nakoda. There's some Nakota reserves in Canada that we collaborated with coming up with a standardized uh, Nakota orthography. And it, they, it's, it was created in Fort Belknap, so, they, so all the other reserves have, are, are using that. So we collab with them on like the Nakota curriculum that I was talking about. We, so we collab with the uh, uh, Nakota indigenous people in Canada too. Within then Fort Belknap and uh, Fort Peck has Nakotas on their reservation. Um, and for Aani, um, I'm gonna give it a whirl. <laughs> um, so a lot of their, um, they're a separate language. Um, they're very, I guess, East, uh, Northern Arapaho down in Wyoming. Their language with an and, and Aani, they're very similar, like how Nakoda and Lakota is, but they, they have their own dialect too. Um, a lot of their um, language uh, stuff is, I think, at the Colorado University. Um, they, they have a lot of their language material that we, we've actually had to go, I had to send staff member there and to Indiana to to scan thousands of documents to get. So part of all this language is bringing it all back, is identifying where it is all at, at these different 
universities and sending our staff out there to go get it. Even at the, um, what is it, the Native American Museum, I think at Washington, D.C. So it, it's all that work too, not only just, you know, doing the work at home. So it's a lot, <laughs> a lot of wheel spinning. Um, I hope that it, is that explained? Yep. And uh, Josie, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that, so there's, there are two distinct tribes and two totally different language families yeah. on Fort Belknap, and those tribes historically were not very friendly to each yeah, other. So when the, when the government put communities onto reservations, putting people who they didn't think were going to get along together was a strategy, right? And, and Josie's community shows them they're wrong. <laughs> yes. So I have, to, I have two questions. The first question is, to visit either the APR or the, reser the reservation, do you have to get advance reservations? to visit or can you just show up? Question number one, hopefully that's easily easy. The second question is, when you have a, an animal population that's nearly extirpated, how much genetic diversity is there or isn't there? And if there isn't a lot of genetic diversity, how do you deal with that or what type of problems does it present? Two great questions. Um, one, you can you don't have to give us notice. You can just come see us. Um, American Prairie, again, totally open to the public. Tons of places to just go, explore, dispersed camp. Or if you want to stay in our hut system or one of our two campgrounds, you can book those online. Um, and that's very easy to do. But otherwise, you can stop in at our center in Lewistown. You can go out there. You can drive. You can walk. Anything that you want. Um, Josie, do you want to answer that from a Fort Belknap perspective? Yeah, um, you're the same thing uh, as Corey. Uh, you don't have to get special permission to um, drive on our reservation. Uh, that we are bison herd. We have two. One is out at the Snake Butte. That's more of our wild. The, um, it's not pure genetic, um, but there's still bison. <laughs> um, and then we have our Yellowstone herd. That's on Highway 66. It's just right off. There's a turnoff there and a kiosk um, and people are welcome to view the buffalo there. You don't need a reservation for that. Um, but if you are interested in a tour, um, I would you know, suggest either reaching out to me. Um, I have cards, <laughs> our email, uh, George Horse Capture, our P, our website, they, their numbers are on there. Um, and to book a tour, um, we collab a lot with American Prairie, so yeah, it's just, um, the Hayes Power is the second weekend in August, and that is through the beautiful Mission Canyon. I don't know if you, it's a kind of a hidden gem in Montana, but it's a natural formed canyon. There's a road through there, and it's a few miles. You go up to the Power Grounds, and it's in the middle of the Little Rockies. So it's a really beautiful powwow. Yeah, I was just I was going to recommend to put that on your bucket list too. Um, that's just. I've been to that powwow the past couple of years, and you're just in this beautiful canyon and this like aspen grove and this big arbor where dancers come, and um, and it, it's totally open to the public, right, Jos? Um, so yeah, check that out. Um, your other question is about bison genetics, um, which is a really interesting one, right? So we know that bison got down to just a few dozen animals um, at the turn of the century, and some of those were in private herds, some of those were in Yellowstone. Um, and so that is something that we monitor closely, right? And we, we know that there's been a lot of what we call cattle gene introgression into the bison genome, um, because people were intentionally crossing bison and cattle for a long time to make a hardy beefalo or a cattalo or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so we do look for bison that are as genetically pure as possible. And we have a director of bison restoration, my colleague Scott Heidebrink, and that's a big part of his job, is to when we do handling, he's looking at that genetic diversity, he's looking at that, those genomic markers, he is making sure he can pull bison from other places. So we do lots of exchanges with tribal conservation herds, we send bison to them, they send bison to us. Um, that Elk Island herd, where we got our bison initially and then um, Wind Cave. Those are animals I think that trace back to Yellowstone and to the Pablo Allard herd um, from the Blackfeet Reservation. 
And um, it is a challenge, right? And more recent studies have suggested that there may actually be no 100% genetically pure bison. And, and that's okay because a bison is a bison, you know? Like when it's out there doing its thing, um, it doesn't matter if it has 0.04% cattle genes, right? And I don't think we have to be super purists about that. Um, bison will behave like bison behave. But that, that is a, it is not my area of expertise, but um, it is a really interesting question for bison restoration around sort of dealing with that historic bottleneck and bringing these populations back and keeping the pool diverse. Do you have a question? Are we using fire? Are we using fire? That is a great question. Um, I'll answer it and then I'll let Josie answer it too. Um, you know, fire is an important ecological actor on the prairie, um, and we know that indigenous communities used it at the time of Lewis and Clark and for millennia before. It is hard to use fire when you have across the fence neighbors who don't think the same about fire as you do. Um, it is hard to use fire when you've had a drought for the past three or four years, which we have. Um, some fires happen naturally out there. Um, the Missouri River Breaks, the Charles M. Russell Wildlife Refuge, they've had some really big fires historically, and they actually are doing some intentional ecological burning this year, which is cool because we've had a wet year and we can even think about it, which we couldn't for a few years. It is one of our goals at American Prairie to see fire functioning again as an ecosystem factor. Um, but it's not something we've been able to do in the past few years between drought and kind of trying to maintain that good neighbor relationship um, and kind of figuring out the right property to do that on. But it is, it is an important part of the, the prairie story. Uh, just a, a quick, uh, try to answer your question on, I know for like Nakoda's, um, I, I am a descendant from the Buffalo Chaser Society, so my ancestors were, I mean, there's other indigenous, but it was a society where they um, chased buffalo over the buffalo jumps and, you know, buffalo hunts and whatnot. And one of the ways that they drew the buffalo in to those buffalo jumps was they did intentional burns to make the grass grow and draw them in that way. So just, uh, I'm, but I'm still learning stuff about, so I do apologize, but I do know that. Um, and thank you, that was an, an awesome question. I hope I answered that. I'm gonna go here and then there, okay. So I do habitat restoration on the East Coast and our biggest problem are invasive species. Eradicating them takes nearly a decade before we can replant. Do you have invasive plant species that you have to manage? Uh, we do, and I, again, I'm not the expert on that. Um, I know that we and ranchers and farmers all across central Montana deal with things like leafy spurge and um, Russian olive growing in riparian areas, and so we, we do work with some of the agencies on eradication. We work on replanting, um, and you know, we talk about things like juniper encroachment, right? Because we haven't had historical fires, we start to see um, junipers and small shrubbery kind of moving in and, and taking over grassland areas. And so I hope again that we will be able to do more with fire um, ultimately to combat that. But yeah, we, we do have some weed control staff. We have some you know, grassland restoration staff who are looking specifically at, at plants. So it's, it is a problem everywhere. I wish I could say that it wasn't on the prairie, but, but it is. I mean, you know, and people planted um, crested wheatgrass for decades um, to grow for cattle grazing, and that's not a native Montana plant. Um, we're never going to eliminate it. Uh, and so in some places we just have to say, well, this is now a crested wheatgrass prairie, <laughs> right, for at least sections of it. So it is, yeah, it's a, it's a tough invasive world out there. <laughs> okay, you mentioned, I love your comment, uh, the more diverse, the more resilient, but aren't elk uh, part of the ecosystem? And also um, you mentioned grizzly reintroduction. Would that, do you expect that to happen naturally or would you be reintroducing grizzly? 
Great question. Um, yes, elk are definitely part of the ecosystem out there, and we have um, some really healthy populations. Uh, if you come out to visit the Charles M. Russell Wildlife Refuge ever, there's kind of a famous spot just north of the Missouri River called Slippery Ann, and the elk come out in the hundreds during the rut in September, and they kind of gather there by the river, and it's, a, it's become kind of a tourist spot, because you can just go and sit in your lawn chair and watch these crazy bull elk just bugling their brains out and chasing the cows, and it's really, it's fascinating. So we, we work um, with FWP and with our own management to try to grow elk populations as well. Um, with grizzly bears, so American Prairie doesn't have any authority to reintroduce species, right? We're basically, we're a nonprofit, we're a private landowner. Um, any decisions there would be up to the state um, or the federal government. However, grizzly bears have really rebounded in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, a glacier along the Rocky Mountain front. And as Dan Flores said yesterday, they are a plain species and they are coming back on their own. So we've seen documented grizzly bears in some of the island mountain ranges around Lewistown. We've seen them in the Missouri River breaks in the monument. So they're, they're coming and they're gonna use that Missouri River corridor and they're gonna use the island mountain ranges to disperse and to spread east. Um, so our goal is that when they get to us, we will have a land base where they are welcome and we will have worked with landowners in the Wild Sky Program to create social tolerance. And the state is doing some of that too. FWP has done some town halls and meetings about living with grizzlies, right? People on the western side of Montana have been living with grizzlies for a long time, but it feels very scary, I think, to people in central Montana, right? That, that kind of shifting baseline syndrome, right? Again, Dan mentioned this last night too, like what you know is normal. And if you haven't known grizzly bears and your father or grandfather didn't live with grizzly bears, that's, that's a tough change to contemplate. Um, but they, they will, they'll get there. Um, same with wolves, that's a tougher story. Um, they're not, there have been some documented um, wolves coming into like the Glasgow area in central Montana. They tend to get shot pretty quickly. Um, but I think eventually they'll make it back um, and I think we can, all, we can all work together in creating space where people can accept that and be prepared for that. Great question. Okay. Great question. Um, pretty differently, I'll answer and then give it to Josie. Um, American Prairie is totally privately funded. Um, so we rely on donors from Montana, donors from across the country, people who give us five bucks and people who give us $5 million. Um, so American Prairie does have some really large donors. Um, that's something that bothers some people. Um, you know, there is sort of disproportionate power and wealth. Um, and so I think we sometimes hear, well, you've got you know, out-of-state donors from New York or California. Um, and, and I hear that, and I also respect people's rights to spend their money on things that they, they wanna spend their money on. But yeah, we're all privately funded. We don't, um, we do some foundation work, but we don't apply for, for federal or state grants. Uh, our native nonprofit is funded by our, we have a for-profit corporation on Fort Belknap, so we get support from them. You might have heard of them, Island Mountain Development Group. So they support um, our nonprofit. We also get um, funding through private um, grant grants, uh, foundation grants, um, federal and state grants also, but you know, grant money can only go so far. Um, that's one of the um, things with growing our programs is uh, building in that sustainability piece where we're able to generate revenue that can go back into our programs. So that's, an, I forgot to touch on that too. I was a, I'm a um, big supporter of that and the projects that we do is um, working in that sustainability piece and like with Native Games, you know, the revenue that we get from that will go back into all of our programs. So, hope that answers. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, so much. It's, I mean, it's fun to present, but it's also way more fun to talk to you and answer your great questions. So, um, we'll be around for a little bit, I think, before we take off. Again, there's some American Prairie maps and materials out there. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us here. Thank you, Josie. 